Song of the Lark, Willow Cather. Part 1. Friends of Childhood Dr. Howard Archie had just come up from a game of pool with a Jewish clothier and two traveling men who happened to be staying overnight in Moonstone. His officers were in the Duke Block, over the drugstore. Larry, the doctor's man, had lit the overhead light in the waiting room and the double student's lamp on the desk in the study. The isinglass slides of the hard coal burner were aglow, and the air in the study was so hot that as he came in, the doctor opened the door into his little operating room, where there was no stove. The waiting room was carpeted and stiffly furnished, something like a country flower parlor. The study had worn, unpainted floors, but there was a look of winter comfort about it. The doctor's flat-top desk was large and well-made. The papers were in orderly piles under glass weights. Behind the stove, a wide bookcase with double glass doors reached from the floor to the ceiling. It was filled with medical books of every thickness and color. On the top shelf stood a long row of thirty or forty volumes, bound all alike in dark mottled board covers with imitation leather backs. As the doctor in New England vis villages is preferably old, so the doctor in small Colorado towns twenty-five years ago was generally young. Dr. Archie was barely thirty. He was tall with massive shoulders, which he held stiffly, and a large, well-shaped head. He was a distinguished-looking man, for that part of the world at least. There was something individual in the way in which his reddish-brown hair, partly cleanly, parted cleanly at the side, bushed over his high forehead. His nose was straight and thick, and his eyes were intelligent. He wore a curly, reddish mustache and an imperial cut trimly, which made him look a little like the pictures of Napoleon III. His hands were large and well-kept, but ruggedly formed, and the backs were shaded with crinkly, reddish hair. He wore a blue suit of woolly, wide whaled serge. The traveling men had known at a glance that it was made by a Denver tailor. The doctor was always well-dressed. Dr. Archie turned up the student's lamp and sat down in the swivel chair before his desk. He sat uneasily beating a tattoo on his knees with his fingers, and looked about him as if he were bored. He glanced at his watch, then absently took from his pocket a bunch of small keys, selected one, and looked at it. A contemptuous smile, barely perceptible, played on his lips, but his eyes remained meditative. Behind the door that led into the hall, under his buffalo skin driving coat was a locked cupboard. This the doctor opened mechanically, kicking aside a pile of muddy overshoes. Inside, on the shelves, were whiskey glasses and decanters, lemons, sugar, and bitters. Hearing a step in the empty, echoing hall without, the doctor closed the cupboard again, snapping the Yale lock. The door of the waiting room opened. A man opened and came on into the consulting room. Good evening, Mr. Kronberg, said the doctor carelessly. Sit down. His visitor was a tall, loosely built man with a thin brown beard striped with gray. He wore a frock coat, a broad-brimmed black hat, a wide lawn necktie, and steel-rimmed spectacles. Altogether, there was a pretentious and important air about him as he lifted the skirts of his coat sat down. Good evening, doctor. Can you step around to the house with me? I think Mrs. Kronberg will need you this evening. This was said with profound gravity and curiously enough with a slight embarrassment. Any hurry? The doctor asked over his shoulder as he went into his operating room. Dr. Kronberg coughed behind his hand and contracted his brows. His face threatened at every moment to break into a smile of foolish excitement. He controlled it only by calling upon his habitual pulpit manner. Well, I think it would, might as be good to go immediately. Mrs. Kronberg will be more comfortable if you are there 
She's been suffering for some time. The doctor came back and threw a black bag upon his desk. He wrote some instructions for his man on a prescription pad and then drew on his overcoat. Already he announced, putting out his lamp. Mr. Kronberg rose and they tramped through the empty hall and down the stairway to the street. The drugstore below was dark and the saloon next door was just closing. Every other light on Main Street was out. On either side of the road and at the outer edge of the board sidewalk, the snow had been shoveled into breastworks. The town looked small and black, flattened down in the snow, muffled and all but extinguished. Overhead, the stars shone gloriously. It was impossible not to notice them. The air was so clear that the white sand hills to the east of Moonstone leaned softly. Following the Reverend Mr. Kronberg along the narrow walk, past the little dark sleeping houses, the doctor looked up at the flashing night and whistled softly. It did seem that people were stupider than they need be, as if on a night like this there ought to be something better to do than to sleep nine hours or to assist Mrs. Kronberg in functions which she should have performed so admirably unaided. He wished he had gone down to Denver to hear Faye Templeton sing Seesaw. Then he remembered that he had a personal interest in this family after all. They turned into another street and saw before them lighted windows, a low story and a half house with a wing built on it right and a kitchen addition at the back, everything a little on the slant, roofs, windows, and doors. As they approached the gate, Peter Kronberg's pace grew brisker. His nervous ministerial cough annoyed the doctor, exactly as if he were going to give out a text, he thought. He drew off his glove and felt in his vest pocket. Have a troach, Kronberg, he said, producing some. Sent me for samples. Very good for a rough throat. Ah, thank you, thank you. I was in something of a hurry. I neglected to put on my overshoes. Here we are, doctor. Kronberg opened his front door, seemed delighted to be at home again. The front hall was dark and cold. The hat rack was hung with an astonishing number of children's hats and caps and cloaks. They were even piled on the table beneath the hat rack. Under the table was a heap of rubbers and overshoes. While the doctor hung up his coat and hat, Peter Kronberg opened the door into the living room. A glare of light greeted them and a rush of hot, stale air smelling of warming flannels. At three o'clock in the morning, Dr. Archie was in the parlor putting on his cuffs and coat. There was no spare bedroom in that house. Peter Kronberg's seventh child, a boy, was being soothed and cosseted by his aunt. Mrs. Kronberg was asleep, and the doctor was going home. But he wanted first to speak to Kronberg, who, coatless and fluttery, was pouring coal into the kitchen stove. As the doctor crossed the dining room, he paused and listened. From one of the wing rooms, off to the left, he heard rapid, distressed breathing. He went to the kitchen door. One of the children sick in there, he asked, nodding toward the partition. Kronberg hung up the stove lifter and dusted his fingers. It must be Thea. I meant to ask you to look at her. She has a croupy cold, but in my excitement, Mrs. Kronberg is doing finely, eh, doctor? Not many of your patients with such a constitution, I expect. Oh, yes, she's a fine mother. The doctor took up the lump from the kitchen table, the lamp from the kitchen table, and unceremoniously went into the ring room. Two chubby little boys were asleep in a double bed with the cover lids over their noses and their feet drawn up. In a single bed next to theirs lay a little girl of eleven, wide awake, two yellow braids sticking up on a pillow behind her. Her face was scarlet, and her eyes were blazing. The doctor shut the door behind him. Feel pretty sick, Thea, he asked, as he took out his temperature. Why didn't you call somebody? She looked at him with greedy affection. I thought you were here, she spoke between quick breaths. There's a new baby, isn't there? Which? Which? Which, repeated the doctor. Brother or sister? He smiled and sat down on the edge of the bed. Brother, he said, taking her hand. Open. Good. Brothers are better, she murmured, as he put the glass tube under her tongue. Now, be still. I want to count. 